So just to define acute severe ulcerative colitis, uh, this is um, the tra Travlo and Witz criteria. And again, just showing you that the patient that Jenny presented, Dr. Sock presented, uh, clearly met the criteria with the amount of bloody stools um, the, and then other uh, considerations uh, if the patient's febrile, tachycardic, uh, anemic, or if their inflammatory markers are elevated. But as we know, uh, inflammatory markers can be normal in up to 20% of patients. So I don't want to dwell too long on the current uh, approach to treating acute severe ulcerative colitis inpatient, because the idea here is to introduce some new approaches. But the mainstay has always been IV corticosteroids. Uh, just as in the case that was presented, the patient was on 60 milligrams total dose. Uh, the primary rescue therapy inpatient has generally been infliximab. It's usually introduced on day three. Uh, that's one of the most important uh, points to draw from the guidelines for treatment of acute severe ulcerative colitis. Um, alternative therapies used sort of in the past, cheaper, older drugs, tacrolimus, cyclosporin. Uh, I'll briefly review some of the data for that. Uh, always important to rule out C. diff and CMV. Uh, antibiotics not recommended by the AGA guidelines. They have some role in pediatrics. There was a study uh, mentioning a four-antibiotic cocktail. It tends to decrease decreased symptoms uh, and act activity index scores, but really there's no role in adult acute severe ulcerative colitis. Uh, always important to remember thromboprophylaxis for our patients. Uh, you know, not only is uh, colitis a huge risk factor for thrombotic events, but especially if our patients are uh, on bed rest or have any other comorbidities super important. And then, as we stated earlier, uh, bringing the surgeons involved, it's very important to get that discussion started early. Uh, it usually leads to better outcomes in patient care and understanding of the severity of their disease. So usually surgical consultation is recommended on day three. So uh, these are the pediatric guidelines from 2018. They mirror the adult guidelines from the same year from the AGA. Um, what you'll see here is uh, the activity index that we're using in pediatrics is called the pediatric ulcerative colitis activity index, but it looks at abdominal pain, a uh, number of stools per day, a nocturnal stooling, uh, and the amount of stool, uh, the amount of blood in the stool. Um, we start anticorticosteroids right from the start. Again, 60 milligrams is sort of your IV dose that's going to be used for most adults. Um, and then you move on to rule out infection, C. diff, CMV, and then ultimately consider uh, infliximab or another rescue therapy on day three. Um, these are just some alternative uh, scoring systems uh, that I wanted to mention from the adults uh, side, the Travis score, um, the Link search score, uh, and you can just see all of them essentially are just depicting the severity of the disease. This is some data showing that despite the fact that we use infliximab as the primary rescue therapy these days, cyclosporin and tacrolimus actually have similar rates for colectomy, uh, avoiding colectomy, and can be used as bridge therapies. That's the main difference. Infliximab can be continued as a maintenance therapy, whereas cyclosporin and tacrolimus are usually used uh, to bridge to something else. Uh, tend to have more side effects uh, given that they're non-biologics, but the big benefit here is cost is significantly less. Uh, this is a study uh, specifically looking at infliximab versus uh, cyclosporin. And what it shows is uh, the early response, which is considered at seven days, uh, was comparable uh, for both drugs. And the clinical response and steroid fee remission at 98 days was also comparable in both drugs. No difference in rates of colectomy either. So. I mean, what I take away from this is that cyclosporin and tacrolimus, we don't think about it often, but uh, they are excellent uh, uh, rescue therapies in the treatment of acute severe UC. Uh, this is where I included some pediatric data, uh, just because I think dose escalation with uh, infliximab, whether it regards to the actual dose, adding an, an additional dose, um, and the pharmacokinetics all play much more of an important role. This is a study uh, from Sick Kids Toronto, it's a big children's hospital. They looked at 125 children 
And basically, they gave an additional dose within a 24-day period uh, for infliximab. This is still dosed five milligrams per kilo, uh, so this traditional FDA-approved dosing. Uh, but the, you can clearly see that the response is better um, with the additional dose. Um, this is looking at dosing 10 per kilo um, and colectomy rates. And you can see that the colectomy rate is significantly better at one year uh, for patients dosed 10 per kilo. In general, you know, in my practice, uh, anyone with hypoalbuminemia, very early onset IBD, uh, stricturing disease, fistulizing disease, I, I mean, I'm always dosing 10 per kilo in general. So in acute severe ulcerative colitis, I think it's a no-brainer. We should be dosing um, at 10 per kilo. Uh, this is just one systematic review looking at sequential rec rescue therapy. So let's say you started on cyclosporin, you went to infliximab, uh, and these are 10 studies. They looked at over 300 uh, patients included in this systematic review, and they showed that basically uh, the adverse events encountered were 23%, including serious infections, but this is a uh, significantly less than what was thought before in terms of risk of sequential therapy. Now, the, the main thing I wanted to introduce today is the guidelines from the University of Michigan thinking about how JAK inhibitors can use, be used in the role of a acute severe UC. Um, as we've already learned, uh, JAK inhibition decreases cytokine-induced stat phosphorylation. Tofacinidib was initially uh, approved for UC. It's a non-selective JAK inhibitor, and upacinidib was a selective JAK1 inhibitor, FDA approved first for Crohn's disease, but now, as Dr. Lumkekai pointed out, also has second-line approval for ulcerative colitis. Another schematic looking at JAK inhibition, I think, uh, we've shown this data in, in the previous lectures. But uh, for acute severe UC, so as a rescue therapy on day three, what, we're, what the new guidelines are proposing, these are from the University of Michigan, not the most robust data to back them up, but is becoming uh, a standard of care at some institutions. So 85% uh, reduction in 90-day colectomy rates with the dosing being 10 milligrams TID. So they did not see any benefit with the dosing of 10 milligrams BID, which is what we use for uh, more severe cases right now. There is no FDA approval for this, for this inpatient use. There's no randomized control trials to support this either. But the ideal candidates who fit the criteria for this potential uh, protocol would be patients who have failed prior biologics, uh, failed outpatient corticosteroids, uh, have a high CRP to albumin ratio, and patients who you might have a uh, some component of uh, immune dysregulation. For example, patients with trisomy 21 tend to have IBD that's more interferon gamma mediated. JAK inhibition is actually an excellent choice in those sort of cases. Um, the relative contraindications, we've already touched on a lot of these. So uh, history of thrombotic events, pregnancy, toxic megacolon, um, concurrent use of strong CYP3A4 uh, inducing medications, malignancy, uh, low ANC, low ALC, although unlike uh, some of the other S1P modulator drugs, uh, the lymphopenia is less severe with tofacinidin and patients with severe hepatic or renal impairment. Um, tofacinib is uh, not recommended if you've given someone infliximab. So say someone is in the hospital, the day three, they got infliximab, they're not responding well. The recommendation is technically in these guidelines to hold off on giving tofacinib. So this would be your rescue therapy introduced as, at day three as your primary therapy. Now, if there is a little bit of an overlap in terms of like a washout period from a prior biologic, I think you have to worry a little bit less in real practice, uh, but this is the, what the guidelines currently recommend. Uh, you have to stop concurrent immunomodulators. Uh, there's a recommendation for vigorous hydration, thromboprophylaxis. Uh, you have to monitor your CRP. And... Uh, Usually the tofacinib, most dramatic effects are seen within 72 hours. So that's the nice thing about these drugs is the benefit. Uh, you should see it pretty quickly. Um, rise in CRP, poor significant uh, 
significant poor prognostic indicator for need for colectomy. So inpatient dosing would be, again, 10 milligrams three times a day. Uh, outpatient, you would transition them to 10 milligrams BID for 12 weeks ideally, and then you decrease further from there, depending on their response, or you transition them to an alternative uh, immunosuppressant or a biologic, because again, tofacinative can you be used either as a bridge or as a maintenance therapy. They also included upacinative uh, in, the, in these guidelines for acute severe UC. Um, it, it, they showed in their data that it's 2.5 times more effective uh, for induction of clinical remission when they compared it to tofacinib. So really, this would be my go-to. Uh, similar patient criteria and similar contraindications, um, and the similar guidance for using concurrent uh, corticosteroids um, and avoiding other biologics or at least having somewhat of a limited uh, washout period. Uh, vigorous hydration, you monitor your CRP um, and make sure you have anticoagulation. The dosing that they used for this is 30 milligrams BID. Um, they, uh, you know, again, the initial induction dosing for outpatient is 45 milligrams. So this is a 25% increase. Um, and they showed that this can, uh, has much better results than the tofacinib. 10 milligrams uh, TID dosing. Um, they also updated their infliximab uh, in this protocol, just to go back there, uh, to a slightly different approach to how they uh, get, provide additional infliximab dosing. So their initial dose, again, is 10 milligrams per kilo, which, as we've said, is sort of the go-to these days. Um, and then 60 to 66 hours post their initial dose, they check a CRP and they check for infliximab antibodies. If the C CRP is greater than 80% of the previous level, they actually just proceed to colectomy. Um, but if you see a reduction in your CRP, you, uh, you proceed with a second dose of the infliximab at 72 hours. If the CRP is less than 0.7, the next dose will be at the two week interval, which is the current standard. Um, that you can still consider a concurrent immunomodulator, although there's probably a little bit less of a rush. Um, so going back to our case, let's say our case, our patient had tried infliximab and then failed, gets readmitted, starts corticosteroids. I think this could be a possible protocol that you could apply here uh, with uh, upacinitib, 40, uh, 30 milligrams BID uh, prior to considering uh, a colectomy. But again, bring your surgeons in early um, because I think this is going to be for cases that are a little bit more refractory and inpatient. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to include this one slide since everyone uh, kind of discouraged as the use of adalimumab and ulcerative colitis, especially because of the varsity trial that Dr. Salk mentioned. Um, and this is just to show after the varsity trial, adalimumab came out with new pediatric dosing for uh, for ulcerative colitis, where it's 80 milligrams uh, every two weeks. Um, so potentially adamilumab has a little bit more of a positive role in ulcerative colitis, uh, but definitely no role in acute severe ulcerative colitis. Um, and it's still not my go-to for uh, the treatment of UC, but potentially this higher dosing could lend it as a more efficacious uh, option. Hey, thank you. All right, thank you very much.